On this edition of Exploring Idaho, it's been called the world's greatest jazz festival. Travel to Moscow and see how Lionel Hampton and friends keep this tradition alive. And join us on a nature walk along the Snake River near Hagerman, a year-round paradise for birds and bird watchers. And winter doesn't freeze the action near Bear Lake. When the snow starts flying, so do the snow machines. Welcome. When you think of exploring Idaho, it's easy to think of all the outdoor opportunities just waiting for us. But every year, there's a migration to the University of Idaho of people who think this is the best place in the world to explore jazz. Moscow, Idaho is where you'll find the heart and heritage of jazz every February, and all thanks to one man, Lionel Hampton. <laughs> the king of the vibraphone. He might as well be called the king of the Palouse, because in this part of Idaho, Lionel Hampton is dearly loved for the music he makes, and for the fact that he makes Moscow the jazz capital of the world for one legend-filled week each year. For the past 28 years, jazz greats have been migrating to the University of Idaho for this festival world-class artists in every manner. I mean, if you take a look at the lineup for this festival, it's never been done anyplace else. Giving some 12,000 young musicians a chance to rub shoulders with Hampton and his friends. Friends like Gene Harris. He's called the churchiest pianist in jazz. They say he turns a keyboard into an altar for preaching the blues. Idaho is lucky to call this blues man from Boise one of its own. Just being here with the, uh, the grand old man, Lionel Hampton, you know, it's just unbelievable to see him go on and on and on. Drummer Paul Humphrey has been playing with Gene Harris for years. It seems his beat has already captured the attention of one young man and the chance to kindle this kind of jazz spirit in today's youth is what brings big names like Lou Rawls to this festival. It's really exciting to see the young faces because that means that the music is going to be around for another generation or two. That's what's great about this festival is that it's helping young people learn about this music, jazz. And it hadn't been that many years ago that I thought we would lose it to generations to come. Play the bass drum here. Right. One, two, 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 three. That's why you'll find more than nightly concerts here. Days are filled with workshops like this, hosted by some of jazz's greatest talent. They're the role models of the jazz world. And if you could bring the greatest role models together at the same time to have young people follow, there isn't a better way to teach about it than that. It's great to know that all of these children that are here are participants in some way, either as vocal groups or playing flute or clarinet, or, but in some way they're participating in jazz. It's wonderful. But the Lionel Hampton Festival does more than bridge the generation gap. This is also a time for jazz pioneers to reminisce about the good old days. It's like holding this picture up and watching it come to life. Everybody start moving again. This photo was taken nearly 40 years ago. 58 great American jazz artists all in one place. Today, four of the dozen or so still alive are together again. Art Farmer, Benny Golson, <laughs> Hank Jones, and Marion McPartland were all there that day. And now these photographers have another rare chance to capture history on film. And when jazz greats gather, 
it's easy to guess what's likely to happen. Jamming may be what these musicians love to do most. Even at 85, Lionel Hampton doesn't miss a session. His amazing talent was first discovered by Louis Armstrong back in 1930, and soon after, he helped make the Benny Goodman Quartet legendary. In the 40s, he formed his own band and found fame with classic songs like Sunny Side of the Street and Central Avenue Breakdown. It's difficult to, in a few words to say what Lionel has done. We who are alive now and are able to see him could compare ourselves to people who were alive and saw Beethoven or Brahms or Bach in their day. Time Grammy Award winner John Hendricks is a bit of a legend himself. He's a leader of the jazz style known as vocalese and reproduces jazz instrumental arrangements with his voice. Sharing the stage with the likes of John Hendricks is a dream come true for Tamika Coleman, a high school student from Boise. She's competed with dozens of student soloists for this honor, and it's easy to see why she's here. It showed me what I can do. It just gave me all kinds of good feelings. It means that our generation can carry on the tradition. Jazz isn't dying. And we're going to keep it moving. <laughs> Successes like this are the real mission of this festival. For Dr. Lynn Skinner and Lionel Hampton, they help make all the hard work that goes into organizing this event worthwhile. It's some of the greatest experiences of a lifetime where jazz has the power to lift the soul. And Lionel Hampton has another dream. He would like to create a university in uptown New York, where, as he says, young black kids could go to school and learn to be doctors, lawyers, IBM technicians, maybe even musicians. Now, if you would like to attend the Lionel Hampton Jazz Festival in Moscow next February, you probably should start planning now. Hotels book up fast. It's a very popular event. We'll be right back. I can't believe our luck. Next, grab your binoculars. You'll see more than ducks and geese along the Snake River. If you've been cooped up all winter and you're looking for a place to go to get a breath of fresh air, maybe even a fresh outlook, let me tell you about the Hagerman Wildlife Area. It's 900 acres of home sweet home to thousands of birds. It's a great place to go to just sit and listen. The first rays of sunrise fall on the Snake River Canyon. In the quiet of a misty morning, the sound of stirring waterfowl drifts through the air. Light filtering through the rising fog creates an eerie landscape. The rhythm of nature is briefly interrupted by a group of local state park officials. And you can hear the coots out there. They're hoping to catch a glimpse of the birds on the water. But this is usually a good, good area for, uh, for Canadian geese. 
Oh, with the habitat you have here, just about everything can be found. It's, okay, yeah, I got some mallards. Yeah, mallards, and look like pintails. The Hagerman Wildlife Area is set aside for wintering waterfowl. It's one of the few areas in the state where the water doesn't freeze in winter, so it's a favorite spot for ducks, geese, and hundreds of other birds. Some are already staking their claim on a good place to raise a family. The amount of stress that we go through these days, it's just nice to come out here and it's very peaceful. Great place to come and watch. Sit here for hours. We have mallards, mud hens, teal. Uh, off over here on the one side, I've seen some geese. All the sounds are incredible. All the different birds, you get to a point where you can pick out which sounds belong to which birds. And the blackbirds will sing you a song. Setting aside places like this is also the goal of the Nature Conservancy. The group owns a 400-acre preserve along the river not far from the wildlife area. Once a turn-of-the-century dairy ranch, today this stately old milk barn stands as a reminder of the ranching lifestyle. It's in here right now. I did see it, but it'll be interesting to see if anybody else can spot it. They're looking for a feathered friend that by day hangs out in the rafters of the barn. If you look all the way to the top, you'll see a little screech owl peering down at us. It roosts in here because it's protected from larger birds which are out during the day. And then at night, it can go in and out through the flicker holes, the woodpecker holes in the barn. Flickers make a lot of nesting cavities that other birds will later use, birds such as screech owls and bluebirds and wrens. One species benefiting another is common in nature, and that relationship flourishes wherever land and water meet. Few places are more breathtaking than the spring-fed waterfalls that pour out of the desert cliffs of the Snake River Canyon. When you canoe along the river, you see it's just a thin strip of green plunked down in the desert, and it's just a haven for birds at any time of the year. Nature walks through this year-round haven for birds are rewarding. Along the ridgetops, you can see everything from a family of burrowing owls to soaring birds of prey. I can't believe our luck. That's a perfect example of a soaring bird right there. It's catching a thermal right now. It's turning to stay in the thermal. That's a mature bald eagle, and what a spectacular sight. I think it's just going up and up and up to enjoy the view. It just makes my heart go pitter-patter, and I'd love to be right up there with it. I'd love to be able to do that myself. Intimate encounters with nature, a priceless benefit of exploring Idaho. You may want to mark your calendars for President's Day weekend next February. That's the Hagerman Bird Festival, and there will be special programs and walking tours, a great way to explore the Hagerman Wildlife Area. We'll be right back. Get ready for the ride of your life. Bear Lake is a snow lover's heaven on earth. has officially sprung, but don't tell that to the people who live in the southeast corner of our state. The mountains near Bear Lake are part of what's called the snow zone. Winter comes earlier and stays longer there. But that's okay for folks living near Montpelier.
for them, winter is just another excuse to explore. The secret is knowing the easy way to get around when the snow is higher than your head. Welcome to Bear Lake, 20 miles of glistening water straddling the Idaho-Utah border. Nicknamed Rendezvous Country, it's easy to imagine these secluded shores dotted with mountain men in the early 1800s, or concealing a nervous wild bunch the night before Butch Cassidy's very first bank heist. Some say that stolen loot is still hidden in these mountains, but the real treasure here is easy to see. Miles and miles of scenic beauty waiting to be explored. And in the winter, there's only one way to travel. It's pretty exhilarating to get on a snowmobile and, and go for a ride and see country that you'll never see, ever, on foot, because you can't cover that much terrain. And you can get literally anywhere you want to go. Roy Jacobson knows that getting anywhere is easy here. More than 175 miles of groomed snowmobile trails wind through the peaks and valleys west of Bear Lake. For the inexperienced or the novice rider, that's really what the trail system's for. If they didn't have the trail system, the veteran riders, the good riders, could still get up here. But you would shut out the families and the people that just want to get up and have a nice afternoon in the mountains. These trails, covering three southern Idaho counties, help make this area safe for snowmobilers. It's Alan Eborn's job to keep the trails well-groomed. We have a lot of families taking up the sport of snowmobiling now, and yet not all riders are what we would consider expert. And so the groomed trails are safety corridors for families and inexperienced riders to get into the backcountry and yet find something that will lead them safely around, in and out. It's beauties. Couldn't have picked a better day. For riders with more experience, the trails lead the way in a continuing quest for secluded playgrounds. They make it good for us to get from point A to B and then fan out and, and really explore. It opens up the area, and they can get away from the crowds. If you stay on the trails, there tends to be a lot of people. But the snowmobile, if you're a good rider, you can get up to this part of the country where you can see the view that you have here. And what a view. They say most days you can see 100 miles in any direction. Clear blue skies, just a wonderful sight to see up here. This is one of the best places I've ever been. You've got uh, mountains, you've got bowls, you've got flats, you've got anything from expert rider to the most novice rider. Uh, it all depends on what you want. It's here. And if what you want is powder, you'll be glad to know that the snow here is deep, about 10 feet. Reed Hansen knows only one way to explain it. When you die, this is what it's like in heaven. You're up here in the hills with this white. It's pure and it just rolls like a pillow. And when you go through that powder, and you sink in each little swell of powder and it fluffs out, it's just like you're floating on air. But Doug and Roy share an attitude that's a little more down to earth. The speed, the speed is something I like. It's about like having your own jet fighter. It never gets boring. A rush is a pretty tame word for it. And it gets your adrenaline pumping and it'll get you going. No matter what your attraction to this sport, these riders all agree this trail system and the surrounding open space will satisfy all comers. It makes it a lot of fun in the wintertime. People are starting to realize what kind of country we have here and once they get a taste of it, it spreads like wildfire. It's uh... Just a delightful way to spend the weekend. Across Idaho, trail systems like this are made possible through county registration fees. The three counties that share the trails you just saw work together to provide a great experience for snowmobilers. And riders say that's what makes the program so successful. 
Now, if you'd like more information on the snowmobile trails or anything else you've seen on Exploring Idaho today, stay tuned. We'll tell you how to get that information next. Welcome back. Here's how you can get more information on the stories you've seen on today's show. Call 1-800-443-2461. Ask for the field notes for show number 123. Thanks for exploring Idaho with us. Before we go, here's a tip if you'll be traveling through southern Idaho this spring. Slow down about 25 miles east of Glens Ferry. Malad Gorge State Park is right off the freeway, and it's well worth a stop especially this time of year. Too many drivers speed across the bridges spanning Malad Gorge without realizing the spectacular view that waits below. During spring runoff, the Malad River crashes through this narrow crack in the desert, racing to meet the snake. The 250-foot drop to the canyon floor is imposing. But the highlight here, a waterfall plunging 60 feet into a boiling basin, the Devil's Washbowl. 